Uh, welcome to the Burning Rubber Show. Uh, we have a special, special guest, Carlos Centeno. With me again, always uh, co-hosting is Golden Chess, Justin Rodriguez. What's up, guys? Appreciate you guys having me on here. Very nice uh, shows you've had in the past. And uh, I'm pretty sure the community, they look forward to your shows. I, I, I know I have. I've had conversations with Justin. Uh, Thank your you. Your interviews have been pretty, pretty damn good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Carlos, welcome to the first ever Burning Rubber Zoom edition. Quarantine. And, um, <laughs> and yeah, we're just looking to kick off this season uh, with, I, I know the season's been, it came to a halt uh, because of the current pandemic, but, um, you know, me and you go back and forth almost every day. We still have plans on doing something at some point this year. Um, but uh, like we usually do, Chris, ask the first question. Yeah, so first question always, why handball? Why, why choose handball out of any sport that's out there? Why handball? Uh, growing up, when I was young, I played just about every sport. Um, you know, I was in softball teams. I was in baseball teams. Um, the one sport that I loved growing up watching and never got a chance to play because I lived in the hood was tennis. There was no tennis courts by me, you know? I lived in uh, Crown Heights and um, watching Borg Mac and McEnroe play. I know you guys are like, who? No, um, no. But anyway, they were, yeah, they were, they were just phenomenal, phenomenal matches, you know? And I always wanted to play tennis. Right across the street, there was a schoolyard, big wall, the ball was only a quarter. Mm. Um, so it was like our version of tennis, you know, and yeah. um, being, you know, being a guy that played all sports, it quickly developed into like, I, I really want to get good at this, you know? So I started going from park to park before I met Raul Fantauzi and um, he brought me to West Forth and it was a different world there, man. You know, it was, it was just, it, it was like watching McEnroe and Borg play when you went to West Forth in those days. It was just, it was a beautiful, beautiful display of brilliance there. And that's why handball. That's amazing. That's amazing. I, it's funny because when I, when I explain, te when, when I explain tennis, when I explain handball nowadays, I usually tell people it's compact tennis, like just so that they can get the ideas really quickly. Like I just tell them, Right. Same same rules, but like you just get the ball and you're on the court and you can play. And I that's one thing that I loved about the game. Like we didn't have tennis courts around us, but there were walls everywhere. And it's so unique to New York. Like um, growing up, of course, growing up in Coney Island, like almost every school had a handball court. I mean, if you weren't playing right. suicide or anything like that, you were more than likely playing yeah. handball, which is which I loved in uh, like when again uh coming back to it um at my age now i just it i i feel like it's so much part of my identity that coming back to it felt supernatural and like i i just needed it it's like my lifeblood yeah. yes it, it really is it gets I don't, like i said i played every single sport just about and nothing got into you like handball you know nothing everything was just just not the same just, yeah. just not the same you know that one-on-one -on -one or that two-on-two mm, yeah. connection that you had and yeah. yeah it's uh it's a great sport yeah. hopefully someday it, it will re um, rise above what it is now but we can only hope and pray and do our best so carlos i have a quick question um i'm going to assume that you are in fact an A player, correct? Uh, an old retired player. Do you uh, yeah. do you remember when you received your A card? Like what what year was that? What did you accomplish at that point? Did you ever get an actual card, or they didn't exist yet? Yeah, uh, both. A little bit of both. So um, when when I first came on the scene, there was pretty much no A's, no B's. Um, it was pretty much a tournament and you either joined or you didn't. And your first round could be against Buddy 
or Emmett or Flip or Billy the Kid, or it can be against another novice. Um, and you just you just played. You just played, and there was no talk of uh, A player, B player, or anything like that. The A card, actually, I, I received an A card almost uh, maybe 15 years after I started playing was I think when they started giving them out. And um, I remember it. I, it's funny that you bring it up because I remember like it was yesterday. Um, I was in the locker room getting dressed for work and my locker was right next to Buddha. And Buddha was like, oh, hey, um, I just saw Dwight yesterday because I was playing in, um, in Jamaica at, at Liberty Court and he told me to give you this. And when I looked at it, I was like, Oh, it's an A card. I was like, all right. You know, and I took it. Wow. I, it was, I was kind of proud to have received it, you know, but yeah. I was like, all right, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. More geared toward the newer kids, something to strive for, you know. Um, so I saved it, although not to throw anybody under the bus, but this has happened to me throughout my whole life, high school, and even Justin, the name was spelled incorrectly. Oh no! Last name. <laughs> oh no! Listen, what? I'm the only one that that spells it correct, right? With the little <laughs> tilde. Yeah, he throws the enyo in there, even though there's no enyo, but it's all right. Centennial. Uh -huh. It's even spelled incorrectly in my high school diploma. So. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty awesome story. So you received it at work. Now here's a, a follow-up question: When you received it, were you at the top of your game, or was that more like? they recognized how good you were already and gave it to you? Um, me and Buddha, you know, had um, been playing together pretty much around that time. And, you know, we had won quite a few tournaments. Um, I just think that that was around the time when, when um, Saha and Dwight started the A-card movement because not only to recognize players, but also to be able to separate and, um, you know, have the uh, players eat the young, you know, as they do in the jungle um, and be able to have tournaments and say, uh, listen, guys, you know, let's separate the skill level here hmm. so that we can have tournaments for the newer players that are playing and not them have to worry about a Dave Rojas or a Buddy, you know, so... What it was, were the big uh, tournaments back then? Back then. So when I first started, it was Mr. Dave Andre, who um, pretty much put Big Blue Ball on the map. Um, it was a guy in Coney, and um, he, he kind of started the Big Ball tournaments, Morris. Uh, I believe 1985. I may have been the first huge big ball tournament they threw in Coney Island. Um, but back then we didn't travel to Coney much, you know, it was like a two hour train ride. Um, so West Forth, Dave Andre, you know, and Dave Andre spread the love a little bit around, you know, he would throw a tournament in Yankee stadium. He'd throw a tournament in West Forth. Um, a couple of other places, you know, some people had local tournaments. Um, mm -hmm. and, but the big ones was, uh, Dave Andre and then BJ. BJ was one of the first guys because Dave Andre was throwing pink ball, pump ball tournament, mm -hmm. right? The big uh, suit. Um, BJ and Emmett were two of the first guys who walked into West Fork with a blue ball. Mm -hmm. And um, when they first walked in, Emmett, Emmett, very, I love Emmett to death. He was very brash, very brash. So he walked into West Fork. His sneakers were never tied. So he had, you know, he was a tall dude, so he had giant boat feet, right? So he walked in, he almost looked like, you know, like he's stumbling in with giant feet, sneakers just wide open. And he said, I will effing play one here for whatever they want with this ball. You know, the pump ball players, and I got the story from Raul and a few other people. The pump ball players was like, what the hell is this? One by one. Emmett just mowed everybody down. Mm. He walked out that day with over $200, which today, you know, he was playing like five, $10 games. Mm. 
Yeah. Which is like, you know, a grand, let's say. Yeah. The only game he lost was the last game, close game against Buddy. Yeah. Buddy was the master back then, and Buddy just stood by and watched Emmett mow everybody down. And they came in and was like, all right, you know, not to say that Emmett was better than Buddy, but at the time he was in Big Four. But Emmett had played a bunch of games, and they played, and Buddy won a close game. And uh, that was like, I guess, the first one of the first introductions to the Blue Ball in West Fork. That's interesting. But shortly thereafter, BJ started hosting events. BJ was a great host. Um, and shortly after BJ, Lefty Henry, who's one of the oldest promoters that we have out there, started hosting events everywhere, everywhere. And other people took off and ran with it. That's so interesting. So you've actually seen the transition from Pump Ball to Big Blue. Yeah, I came in, I came in at, the, at the death of Pump Ball and mm -hmm. at the birth of Blue Ball. Interesting. Um, the very first tournament I went to actually before West Fork, where Raul took me, the very first tournament, and it was on Flushing, last stop on the seven train, mm. right around the corner uh, from the train, a one wall park. And that was when I first met Billy the Kid, Emmett, and Flip. Flip actually, coincidentally, had. Um, he was, uh, I believe he was the guy that taught Billy the Kid the game, mm. you know, and uh, they, they were fantastic. I lost, by the way, Raul, I believe, lost to Emmett, and Emmett beat Billy the Kid in the final. First tournament I won. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah, we're here. You're, uh, uh, on my screen, you're cutting in and out a little bit. Your kids are probably playing some video games on the <laughs> Wi-Fi. <laughs> Out there. Well, I'm in the extreme outside room, so I'm a little further away from the Wi-Fi. So, mm. if anything, I'll just run inside to the next room because it's closer. But as long as you just let me know if you don't hear anything. No, you're coming in uh, clear now. So, so at some point, you weren't involved in handball, at least to the extent of what you, that you're involved in now. Um, so tell us why you initially left handball and then why you came back. I had, um, I was having some shoulder troubles, like pretty much everyone in handball. Mm. Um, and I had to have surgery and then I came back, shoulder problems again, had to have surgery. More shoulder surgery, came back, more issues with the other shoulder, shoulder surgery, came back and um, it was hard. It was hard, arduous process. It was just, just working your way back from shoulder surgery was tough. And um, after a while I was like, it's just, I, I don't want to do this anymore, you know? And then I took like a hiatus from handball. I didn't even want to go see tournaments or anything for a few years because it hurt, you know? Like just, just watching, you know? kind of like hurts it, it, it this game we all know you know sometimes it ravages the body but it just leaves uh like a blemish in your soul that, that that's all you want to do mm. you know um sometimes you know you see people they neglect their family their kids their mm. jobs you know and and you just it just draws you to it you know there's a certain fire to this game that just brings you in you know so I had to I had to leave the game because it was hard I knew if I stayed around the game I would still play and you know ravage my shoulders again hmm. and um you know so I stepped away and then slowly I started coming back and some of the first tournaments I saw when I came back I was very impressed and they were the tournaments that were run by Tina and Sheena at PHA and um Slowly but surely, it drew me back in. And then I started, you know, attending all the tournaments, started helping ref games for Sheena and Tina or whoever needed me, you know, uh, just to be back in the game, I guess. You know, whatever semblance of the game was left inside of me, I was like, all right, I'll go with just watching, you know, and refing and, and whatever, whatever I can do to help, whether that's donating time or money or helping some players. You know, just to get back in the game and, and feel like you're part of the game. When you started the Buddha Memorial, 
And for people who don't know, you run the Buddha Memorial Tournament in Coney Island. It's a doubles tournament. Um, when you started that, was that like a no brainer for you? Were you, were you, were you, there is, did you decide that the best way to kind of memorialize Buddha's life was with the sport that you both played and loved? Yeah, well, so Buddha passed away in 2006. Um, within about maybe two or three years, um, I had wanted to do something, you know, with the handball community, you know, small little memorial tournament. <clears throat> and, um, but it was hard, obviously. Um, personally, it was hard personally, emotionally. So I kind of like put it to the side. Um, and, uh, but it was, it, it was still there. It was still there. I was still thinking about it. You know, what could I do? Um, and then the, the day that it came to me, I remember exactly where I was at. I was at Gus Indoor in Brooklyn. And um, I was watching a tournament there. And for some reason, watching the tournament and thinking about Buddha kind of clicked in. Mm. And it's just weird that I remember. I, I was watching a tournament at Gus and Wally, Philly Wally was playing and um, the Buddha proposal, I guess, was, I don't know, I, I was just like, all right, for some reason, um, I need to do this. I, I really need to do this tournament. And um, while I was watching that game, I was like, yeah, I have to do this sometime in September. Um, so I had walked up to Wally after his game and I said, listen, you know, I know you're from Philly. Um, I'm probably going to do a memorial tournament for Buddha. Um, and I want to know, you know, if, if you and any other Philly guys would like to come down. And, uh, he said, absolutely. You know, just let me know. I said, yeah, it's probably going to be in September. And from there on in, I started telling different people. Um, and that's how my thought process came about to have the Buddha. And of course, as I've told many people, um, the Buddha was just supposed to be a one tournament, just one and done, you know, a one and done memorial. Um, and, you know, first year it was, it was pretty good. Um, I had a few players actually right after the game ask me if they could pay for the following year. And I was like, no, this is, this is pretty much it. You know, and they're like, oh, okay. But throughout the year, um, and it was one of the last tournaments of the year because it was in September, mid to late September. Um, so throughout the indoor year, people were coming up to me and they're like, oh, it was a really nice tournament. You know, are you going to have it again? And I was pretty much, no, that was it. That was it. That was it. And people just kept coming up to me, coming up to me throughout the start of the next year because I still didn't schedule a date. And I think around May of the following year, I said, you know what? Let's do this again. And, you know, it's grown since. I mean, I would love to know as, you know, and you guys have experience with throwing tournaments, what was your experience like throwing the memorial? What was the experience like from the inception? Like, I mean, you saw Gus's event. What made you think like one, that you could do it and then two, get it executed? Right, so I mean, basically I had been around playing tournaments my whole life and I've helped others with their events. I just never had an event. Mm. Um, so I, I, I knew the formula, you know, mm. to, to put an event, a successful event together. Um, and I didn't doubt that I would be able to do it. Um, and also to do it again, the reason why I thought I wouldn't do it again, it was besides, you know, me saying it was a one and done, it just, you know, it, it, it brought up a lot of feelings, you know, um, with Buddha and everything, you know, um, and while they were all great feelings, you know, it, it still hurt. Mm. Um, so then I was like, it's just, this is a lot, you know, this is really a lot. It's a lot to deal with, you know. Um, but then somewhere as the months rolled by, I was like, yeah, you, we can do this again. We can do this again as long as I get the right team, which was Sheena mm. and Tina and China. You know, mm. before you know it, um, 
the day of the tournament, you know, leading up to the tournament, it was, it was a lot. It, it yeah. is a lot. Tell you us know. about that. Tell us like the experience. And I, I know that it's, it's kind of, uh, give, it might give you like anxiety thinking about the pressure of like getting up to it. But I think that that's something that people need to understand the process of putting uh, an event like this together, like what it takes to, to bring, to make this kind of, this, to build this structure. Explain, yeah. explain to certain individuals in our community that sometimes it takes longer than just a week to throw and host and a successful tournament, but something as big as the Buddha. Right. So, um, you know, listen, as long as you're a fair person, anyone can host an event and host mm -hmm. a successful event. Um, and they can do it in a week, I guess. Um, but you gotta have, you gotta have a connection with the community. For you to be able to do it in a week because they have to trust and respect that you're going to do the right thing for them you know and that doesn't necessarily mean coming out of pocket you know there's just a lot of little things little nuances to running events that um the people that play in them they know and if you don't cover those bases you know they, they've been around the block, you know, they're, so they're like, eh, I don't know if I want to, you know, uh, do this again with this person, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so getting back to the original question, months and months of preparing and um, trying to get sponsors, mm -hmm. um, you know, money wise, it's me and a couple of other people. And then there's always a few people that just donate money. You know, because they knew Buddha or they liked the cause or they liked the event, mm. you know, um, I just, I like to make it a fan friendly experience for the players mm -hmm. and the people that just come to watch. Um, I try to get as much stuff as I can so that there's free drinks, free water throughout the whole event for mm. everyone. Um, nothing is being sold. It's just... You know, because I don't, not that there's anything wrong with that, because I feel like people that throw events sometimes, you know, they, they, they have to have something coming out of it because mm -hmm. we're not all in that position to just pour money into these events. Um, so my wife works for months contacting different people, you know, a lot of products that we get, mm -hmm. a lot of giveaways. Uh, a lot of energy drinks, um, some things we just buy. A uh, good friend and one of the best players that I knew from my day, Paul Praviti, mm -hmm. also helps out with it. My friend Abe puts a lot of money into it. And it's just a lot of things that come together to make the event. But leading up to it, you have to try to put to bring all these things together, right. um, to have deliveries done the day of. You know, where's all this going to be stored at? Because it's being brought to you in different dates, different times. You have to be home. You have to make the connection. You have to reach out to people five, six, ten times sometimes. Because you might get a no. You might get a, I'm not sure. You yeah. know, so you reach out to them. And then finally, when they say, you know, you have to reach back out to them to make sure that it's coming on this date. Yeah. You know, and again, you have to store it. You have to get it there. Um between getting shirts and, you know, trying to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And, and one of the biggest, most difficult things is pre-registration because these mm. guys don't want to trust anybody with their money. Right. Um, you know, so you have to have that relationship with the players that they say, well, yeah, no, he's, he's not taking my money, you know, mm. um, because we're off in the streets. We all know how, how it's done. Right. Mm. You don't just hand over your money to anybody. Mm. Um, but that's, that's very key in, in getting any large event is money in hand before the event, mm. because that, that takes a long time. Once you get to an event, you know, mm. getting everybody's money and then setting it up and then setting the chart. So if you come in ready with everybody's money and the chart all laid out already, mm -hmm. you save yourself at least an hour, at yeah. least, yep. at least an hour you save yeah. yourself. You know, and players then going in, you know, you're ready. The players know who they're playing more or less. 
if, mm. if you have it all set up. And they actually like that. It kind of like amps them up a little bit, you know? Yeah. And uh, then you hear the trash talking, like, I'm going to wash you up. Man, you know, yeah. I got you first round. I'm already looking past you. You know, yeah. all these little things add up and they just come together. But you, you, have, to do the, you have to do the work behind the scenes to get there. And, to, and touching on that, like, how much of what you envisioned the memorial to be is what is kind of like what you visioned, what it became? Yeah, I, I didn't, it, it's gotten pretty big, I have to say. Mm. Um, it's gotten pretty big. You know, I get people from California, um, Jersey, Delaware, New England area, Florida. Mm. Yeah. You know, either, either they come, they want to come, or they're just inquiring about it. You know, mm -hmm. even just inquiring about it, you know, I'm honored. You know, yeah. people from another state are inquiring about coming to my event. Um, so it just, it, it's, it's a very humbling thing, I, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but my vision, again, was a one and done, you mm -hmm. know. And then the next year, I was like, well, let me just try to make it a little bit bigger. Mm. And I've gone with that. So that's been my vision. Every year a little bit bigger, a little bit mm. better. Um, the cash has gone up every year, which is great for the players. Of course. Yeah. Um, the thing that I'm happy about is that we we try to spread it out as much as possible. You know, mm. besides the fact that your entry fee gets you shirts, food, snacks, drinks all day, mm. you know, then we'll have giveaways. Um, last year, I think we paid out like 12 spots, mm. which you don't really see much. Um so the players appreciate that because we all know, right? Who's going to be in the top four, mm. six, eight spots, right? Mm. Like we all know that there's, there's no mystery there, right? There might be a team that gets snagged here or there, mm. but we all know who's going to be in those top spots. And the lesser players, they know that too, mm. you know? So for them to waste a good deal of money in an event, Mm -hmm. that they know they're not going to win is key. And um, so as an event host coordinator, so we have to appeal to the guys that know that they really have no shot at winning, but you know what? I'm going to give you an experience that mm -hmm. you really appreciate. Um, mm -hmm. You may still win something. You may win, in, uh, I think three, I'd give out three or four MVPs last year, right? Mm -hmm. So you may still have a shot at that. You may win a giveaway. Mm -hmm. And and if not, you'll have a good game. You'll be wow. fed. You you won't be thirsty. Mm -hmm. um, I treat everybody like family as much as I can. Um, give the shirt off my back if I can. And, and that's what I go in thinking every year. That's amazing. Yeah, it's wonderful. What made you choose the venue specifically, uh, Coney Island? Uh, besides there being a lot of history at Coney Island, you know, West Forth, but West Forth is definitely out of the equation because there's only three courts, mm. you know, and there's absolutely no parking at West Forth, right? Yeah. Manhattan, <laughs> right? Um, but Coney Island has quite a few courts there, mm. a lot of old time history, mostly small ball, but a lot of old time history, but also a couple of things. Um, Huda was playing almost every day at Coney Island before he passed away. Mm. Um, the day that he passed away, he was actually playing at Coney Island. He left from Coney mm. to go um, to take a ride out to AC on the way back. He had the accident. Um, and also, I like the foot traffic of Coney Island, right? Wow. So you get the players, you get the spectators that are coming for the handball, but you get the foot traffic of a lot of people going to the beach, a mm -hmm. lot of people going to the boardwalk, a lot yep. of people going to Nathan's, going to eat, mm -hmm. just walking around, and they see a crowd, you know? And, because I get it every year. Every year, you know, somebody, hey, what, what is this? What's going yeah. on here, you know? And then you take a little time out and you explain to them, mm -hmm. and you never know who you reach that way. Yeah. You no, know, it, it might be an investor, it yep. might be just a kid, mm -hmm. it might be a player, somewhere yep. along the lines, you know? And you, you, you grab them because this game, mm. this game, when you see it played at its highest level, 
Mm. It's just amazing. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful game, you know, and somebody walking by and they just, you want that interest. You want yes. that. Even, that even if that, even if that person walking by doesn't, doesn't do anything with that interest right away, mm -hmm. it could be two years from now. And it's like, all of a sudden handball comes back up again. And they're like, mm -hmm. wait, I've seen something played at its highest in Coney Island. Let mm -hmm. me see if I could get more information about it. And then boom, you're opening up a door that was never there. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. You know, I've had people walk by when Timbo and Taiwan were playing. Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I mean, I think that was year, year three, year two, maybe. Um, and, and I remember them asking me, you know, about Timbo and Taiwan and, and, and they were like, I, I, I've seen people hit the ball, but I've never seen this. Yeah. You know, I, this is like, how are they hitting? <laughs> and I remember specifically, they were like, how are they hitting the ball that hard? Yeah. You know, because they were just winging it. And I believe they were playing, um, might be, I think Justin's favorite game. Uh, oh, Davo and Gio? Davo and Gio. Mm. And um, like that game is amazing. That that game, Timbo Taiwan, Tavo and Gio, right? I mean, I don't remember guys hitting that ball that hard, that consistently mm. over the course of a 21 point game from point one to point 21. I believe it finished like 21 19. Could have been anyone's game. But if you're walking by and you see that game, you're like, what the hell is this? This is amazing. You know, wow. and that's all we can hope for. Try to capture the imagination of a child, of an investor, mm -hmm. right. of a passerby, of just somebody, just somebody. And that's all we can strive for. Something so beautiful about handball, like you see two guys hitting a ball against the wall, you instantly think you can do that. But, yeah. but that's, that's what gets so, you. That's what so gets like, you. <laughs> It's so beautiful in that way. It's like, wait, and like so many people at, has grown up with some inkling of hitting a ball against the wall. There's not too much there. There's just two people or four with a ball and a wall. And the simplicity of it is so beautiful. Like there's no racket stopping you. There's no hoop that's stopping you. It's instant. You almost instantly understand what's happening. And it's, yes. it's so beautiful. Absolutely. And getting back to what I was saying. So you see some... You, you're walking by and you see Timbo and Taiwan playing Davo and Gio, right? And you're like, yeah. I mean, they're just hitting a ball against the wall. Yeah. I, I can do that. I can do you that. <laughs> and, you jump on and you're like, all right, you know what? Um, maybe those guys are, you know, a little, yeah, yeah. A little bit up here, you know? And uh, it, it, it's funny, but again, it draws you in. It mm -hmm. really draws you in. Yeah. yeah, you stick around to get your, you know, your ass beat a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it happens. It happens. And and like I always say, the best part about handball is every time you step on the court, you're a little better than the last. Mm -hmm. So, like, that's what you get addicted to. Because mm -hmm. you're like, wait a second. I kind of hit that ball harder with my left than I've done in the past. Let me start working on that now. And you hit a miss hit. Forget about it. Now you're bragging. Oh, did you record that? I could do that anytime I want. And again, it's just pulling you in slowly. And it's just what it's, it's, it's how we could in, in a, in a world where handball is not professional and it's not publicized the way that it should be. The only way we can currently get more players into the game is getting them on that court the first time, mm. you know? So how much easier is it to tell someone that's walking by Hey, why don't you come on over here and try it versus you watching it on your when you're laying it down in bed, watching it on TV because it popped up on your screen and you're like, nah, that's just handball. Like it's 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 not even in front of you. Right. We need we need to also keep bringing them back. Yeah. Um, that's why the 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 social media aspect of it is important too because we have to have an outlet for people that have played it once or twice casually and then they go on you know um i know people like um sheena and margarita and i know that they record a lot of times for Hamble united and he puts out a ton of videos i try to put out a ton of videos on 
to YouTube. Um, Chris does his own version of videos and interviews and just flooding social media and getting interest in social media so that they can look it up and say, you know what? Even an instructional video from Angel Marquez may help me out. Mm -hmm. You know, um, however we can reel people in because, you know, the, the, the sport has before COVID, obviously, you know, the sport had a lot of obstacles and that was trying to grow the sport because it's fallen out of favor in the schools, mm. you know, whereas it used to be big in the schools and the schools would travel and play other schools and stuff. Mm. That is no more. Mm. So we need to find ways to bring people back in to the sport and stay connected to the sport and uh, go from there. Yeah, that's interesting. Would, would you ever think about um, starting like younger um, events for younger people to uh, to get into the sport, start playing the sport? I literally uh, just wrote that down to ask. <laughs> Buddha Juniors? <laughs> that, is, that is a wonderful thing. Um, the only thing with that is it's like, so I personally, I love the juniors that have been thrown by the people that do them and they've done them without any regards financially to, mm. to what they, you know, they've put all the money into it, which was PHA, mm. um, Veronica and Richie, the juniors that they ran, you know, and I think Veronica had um, WPH helping her out as well. Mm. So WPH, um, their juniors were spectacular. Like I couldn't, I couldn't even touch that to be honest with you, you know, like running the Buddha is hard enough, you know, and, and, all, and, um, but like, and I've gone to a few of them and what they've done, you know, has been remarkable, mm. remarkable. I just hope that we can continue to do that year after year mm. um, with some of the people like that, that do the juniors because there has been no better junior events than those three that I have mentioned that I have attended. Hmm. Um, Richie Vera, which is, he's an incredible human being and the stuff that he does for our community is like, there's no one above him. The hmm. stuff that he's done for our community. Um, and his junior events, it's like a back to school. He gives thousands and thousands of dollars in, in, in like school products, you know, book bags hmm. full of stuff. Wow. You know, it's just unbelievable. And we could all take a lesson from them in what they have done. Uh, a Buddha Juniors? It'd be tough, but, you know, I mean, we all know Buddha like to curse a little bit, so, we, you know, there's no curse in there. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it, it's funny that you, that you brought that up because this year everything's changed, obviously, right? Mm. We're just hoping to have some kind of a season. Mm. But with um, one of the sponsors that I had coming in, um, they had actually wanted to send people to Coney Island the day of, mm. um, not just with product, but send their marketing people and do something on one of the courts with the kids. Mm. Um, and I, I thought that was great. That that may be a jump off. You know, wow. now I, I just don't know if it's going to be feasible. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's something, you know, that I'll keep in mind. And, uh, if we do have our season going forward, you know, hopefully it won't be forgotten and, uh, we can, we can actually put something together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so to touch on that, um, mm -hmm. before we wrap things up here, can you let people watching this know what are your potential plans for the Buddha Memorial 2020. Right. Okay. So obviously there's an uncertainty. We are in uncertain times. Um, I still look to try to host this tournament. I've gotten a lot of people to pay me. And even over the last week, people have actually reached out to me to pay for the event, you know, cause again, they know their money is safe. I have various, 
um, outlets, you know, whether it's Cash App, Venmo, whatever, where I keep their money. And uh, so I'm still looking to host this event, just like I'm st we're still looking to hold the Be Singles, you know, uh, with Justin, uh, Sheena, and Adam. Um, so hopefully we can have a season. As something opens up, as things start to open up, they open up parks, you know, we can still have that B singles within a few hours because I'm confident enough in my team um, and in the players that we, we chose to play that it's something that can come together very quickly. Uh, we can live stream it to everybody so that everybody can see it. And um, I think it'll, it'll be a good jump off point to show that we can do this. And then in regards to the Buddha, obviously we're going to need it to be a more wide open type of spacing, you know, for, we're going to need the parks to really open up for the Buddha to, to take place like the Buddha has taken place in the past. Mm -hmm. If, and I've discussed this with a few people, um, and this is the first time I'm discussing it, I guess, with a lot of people, if that's not the case, if we can't have something like that, then obviously I would refund the money to the people that can't, you know, won't be um, making it to the Buddha. And if it's, we revert to the case of, let's say they say, all right, you can have about 50 people in the park at a time, an event, 50 people or less. Um, then I would look to do something because I still don't want to bypass the year. I would look to do something, maybe something like I discussed with Justin and a few other guys, um, Buddha Memorial Champions Edition. And I would invite probably 16 teams, and they would be teams or players that have placed in the Buddha over the years. Um, you know, we've had a lot of players place, so it, getting 16 teams would be doable. And then we could keep that under the limit of how many teams, how many people they allow us to have mm -hmm. uh, and still maintain some kind of social distancing mm -hmm. and 16 teams, you know, we can run in a few hours mm -hmm. and, and still have a very high level event. Mm -hmm. um, and you can and live stream it too. You can have like yeah. an official channel whether it's Twitch or YouTube, where you're covering, you know, all the games, mostly, you know, how ESPN covers, you know, right. uh, multiple angles at a time and, you know, getting uh, sponsors to see like who's subscribing and like documenting who's watching will be huge benef benefit to you guys as well. Yes, no, I, I agree. That's, that's actually a great idea, you know, and like, we were talking about doing the B singles. Mm -hmm. It would probably just be, you know, a live stream event mm -hmm. and only the players there. Right. If right. We didn't have the permission at that point in time to have more than 50 people in one area. Wow. Um, you know, and then with the Buddha, again, we, we need, we need things to go back to the way they were. And if mm -hmm. they don't, then that may be something that, um, that I would want to do going forward to kind of like just have the event for, for the players that deserve an event, you know, that every year they, they come out and they spend the whole day, you know, there and 98% of them get there when I ask them to get there, which is very early and Coney Island is very far. Mm -hmm. So let me just reach out to the players and say every year, I really appreciate what you guys do. Um, and that's why I'm very dedicated to it and to you guys, because I appreciate what you guys do, the sacrifices, you know, getting there, paying me on time, paying me well, paying me months ahead of time and trusting me. And you guys are the reason why I do what I do. It's amazing, man. That's going to be exciting if it happens. Either way, the Buddha is something that we all look forward to, whether it's going to be a regular Buddha memorial or the Buddha memorial style of champions um you know i will be in attendance of helping regardless 
Yeah, I look forward to hopefully we can we can have a season. You know, yeah. we 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 need a season. We've we've dealt with enough. Um, we've suffered enough, you know, um, I just want to see some handball. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, I want to see some handball. I want to see some handball played at its highest level, at medium level, at any level. I want some handball, you know, um, I need to get yeah. out. Of, I need to get out of the house. I just need <laughs> you know, I'm driving my wife crazy. The kids are driving me crazy. Um, we, we need that. We all need that. Oh yeah. I want to thank all the people that came before me in hosting events, mm. you know, like the Sahas, Veronica, Sheena, Tina, China, you know, all the people that have helped me out, Richie Vera, you know, we're just one large community. Mm. Um, and you know, we don't always all get along in the community, but we all have, or I would like to think that we all have the same drive and the same purpose mm. and we're all reaching for the same thing. Uh, Justin, do you want to try and do the uh, lightning round? Yeah, the, the, yeah. the famous lightning round. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm missing one. So, Chris, um, if I can't think of it, I'm going to need you to, end, to ask the last, the last question here. But okay. call it lightning round. Um, oh. And when I ask you a question, I just want you to answer it. The first name, the first thought that comes to your head. All right. I don't have to hit that buzzer. No buzzer. <laughs> no buzzer. No buzzer. Uh, so the first one is, who's your favorite partner that you ever played with? Buddha. Where's your favorite court? Coney. Your favorite tournament that you've attended? Attended. King of Could the be. Courts. King of the Courts. Your favorite shot? My favorite shot. Spike to the left corner. And um, Chris, you got another one? The last one, so we had two. We had favorite person, favorite partner, but then favorite player. Favorite player, buddy. He's like, he's like Jesus walking on water. <laughs> you know? um, just first, real quick, first tournament I ever went to in West 4th, doubles. Yeah. Raul went up to Buddy and asked Buddy, he was like, hey, buddy, listen, um, this is my friend Carlos. He's going to play with you in the tournament if you don't have a partner. And I was like, <laughs> I'm like are you serious? You know, it's like walking up to the Pope, you know. <laughs> um, and buddy looked at me. He goes, all right, but let's play a quick money game first. Mm. So not, the, the pressure was just immense, right? Um, so we're playing a money game. And there was, I was playing the power side because Buddy, Buddy was so good. He didn't, he, he could let you shine, right? And then Buddy would make you look good because he did everything right mm. from whatever side he played on, but he let you shine because Buddy didn't care about shining. Buddy cared about winning, mm. right? So I'm playing the power side and I'm trying to impress Buddy, right? And I go for a punch shot, which I hardly ever did in those days, right? Buddy sticks his sweet, beautiful left in there, right? I punched three fingers of his left hand in and jammed his fingers. Money game before the tournament. <laughs> he looked at me, right? I was like, I didn't even want to, I didn't even want to make eye contact with the man. I was like, <laughs> right? We win the game. Afterwards, I walk up to Raul and I was like, I just ruined the Mona Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was my words. I said, I just, and I was mad at Raul. I was like, why would you do this? Why mm. would you do this? I just ruined the Mona Lisa. Forget about him playing, but mm. in the tournament with me, you know, but if I hurt his fingers that bad, I'm like, what am I going to do? Right. You know, buddy walked over. He was like, don't worry about it, kid. It's all right. You know, he hardly played the tournament with his left hand at all. We won, we won the tournament. You know, mm. I, I played my ass off, but it was because I was still playing with Buddy. You know, like I didn't have to do much. Even though mm. I played the power side the whole game and he played with one hand, it was still Buddy. So everything he did was just phenomenal. And he carried me with one hand. <laughs> the house, you know, so I just had to get that story out there. 
So favorite player of all time, absolutely, without a doubt, Buddy. That's pretty amazing. awesome. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much, Carlos, man. This is why we do it. I mean, that, that story alone was gold, man. That's amazing. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. Appreciate what you guys do, man. All right. Talk to you later, man. All right. Peace.